a collaboration um, we started talking about here, part of my transition and talking with the Board of Education, with our principal was the idea of making sure we include an increased student voice. Um, that is something that I really dialed into as I became a principal. I realized how many times we made decisions and sometimes forgot to ask the people most impacted by that decision. Um, so this year, um, we very quickly pivoted. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And I know Mr. Winter Warren wasn't able to be here, um, as well as Mrs. Hedgecourt, and put together a superintendent's advisory um, council is what we're calling it. So we invited everyone in grades 7 through 12 to apply. Um, we had a great turnout. And originally, we thought we would just keep two per grade level. Well, the videos came back. And so what the application was, we asked them why they wanted to be a part of this group and they had to do a two minute video and then send it back to us. After some technology um, issues were resolved, we were able to watch those, got some input from other um, people at central office, sent it back to the buildings to get some input. And before you are the members of the superintendent's advisory council. Not all could make it, but we have 20 members um, based on um, grade levels, we only have one freshman, so next year we'll be recruiting some more in there, and we only have three seniors, which is okay. It's a great group. We had our first meeting. Um, I will share with you guys our mission and our norms, which we developed that first meeting, and then at the end, we do kind of a, what we called it was like a hot topic, so like what's coming up in your world, and got some great feedback from the students, and this time, Mrs. Hedgecourt and I took it back to the principals, but as we were talking with them, they challenged us to say, hey, have our kids do that. So starting in October, get ready, guys. Mm -hmm. The things that we talk about at the end of our time together, you're going to take back to your building principals that impact the building and have that conversation with them. So it'll be a great leadership opportunity. You don't all have to do it every time. Um, although Mr. Moore, I'm sure would love to meet with the 16 of you uh, or the 14 of you, it would be okay if you guys don't all go and kind of take turns. But I would like to get a chance if you guys would all introduce yourselves, what you're involved in, and then who is here with you at, that may have driven you here or just <laughs> came to celebrate you. So I would, I don't, I don't want to volunteer anyone. Would anyone volunteer themselves to go first? Go ahead. Go ahead. Stand up, please. Stand up, please. <laughs> and sophomore, right? And you get to pick, Natalie, left and, and hand left, left or, or behind. Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> yeah. Which way? Are you going? Oh, there you go. Left. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kylie Bollinger. I'm a junior this year. I'm in the band, volleyball, basketball track, and the youth coalition. And I'm here with my dad. So. Hi, I'm Lucy Seiler. I'm a senior, and I am involved in student council, youth coalition, interact, and FCCLA. And I'm here with my mom. Hi, I'm Michaela Frankum. I'm a junior. Um, I'm a cheerleader. I'm in Stuco and FCA, and I'm here with my mom. I'm Emma Ulidol. I'm involved in the Student Youth Coalition of Soccer and the High School Guards. And sophomore? The sophomore class seems to forget their class, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's all her eye. <laughs> You're great. Can I just ask? No, just take a deep breath. I'm Abigail Dorsey. I don't do any school sports and I'm here with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take. We'll take. Hi, my name is Mariah. I'm in cheer, stucco, and dance. And I'm an eighth grader, and I'm here with my mom. Hi, I'm JC Carlisle. I'm in eighth grade. I do cheer, student council, and track, and I'm here with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Emma Marshall. I do cross country, archery, basketball, 4-H, and Stuco, 
uh, and I'm here with my mom, and I'm Nathan. Hi, I'm Nathan Fletcher. I do band FBOI robotics and a couple other stuff. I'm a senior, and my mom's on the live stream. <laughs> I think we we still have a couple. At least one or two. In the back. Yeah. Volleyball play. I'm Elena Craig. I'm in seventh grade. I do school volleyball in Stucco, and I'm here with my mom. Yep. Hi, I'm Sophia Thomas. I'm a senior. I do theater and choir, and I'm here with my mom and dad. Thank you. Thank you all. Can we? All right, guys, the last thing that I will ask you to do, if you wouldn't mind coming through and shaking the hands of the board members, and then if you would like, you can take this opportunity to continue to walk out the door. <laughs> <laughs> or you can stay for our tax yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Go get it. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming. Yep. Sorry. Uh, I'm sure you got it. We'll get a picture next time. I'm sure she got a couple. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. It's all cleared out now. Well, the tax rate here oh, really clears it out, doesn't it? <laughs> we don't need all these chairs anymore. <laughs> Brooke's like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was cool i'm so excited for that fantastic well that's that's exciting to see and uh great to see all the great involvement from the kiddos uh next time the agenda 7.1 adoption or modification of the agenda is there anything uh folks would like to modify on the agenda if not an entertaining a motion to adopt the agenda as presented so moved second we have a motion and a second. If there's no discussion, please vote. Motion carries uh, six zero. I will note uh, uh, Mr. Nichols is uh, on the uh, Zoom and participating. Uh, Mr. Saxton is uh, otherwise indisposed this evening. The next item on agenda is 8.1 2023 uh, tax rate hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on the, uh, the tax rate is uh, welcome to do so at this time. Uh, please stand up, approach the podium, and give us your name and address and uh, share your comments. Brooke? See no comments. Uh, we'll uh, uh, address uh, 8.1 the 2023 tax rate. Are there any questions on this? Sure. No. Thanks, Mr. Bloomker. Um, going through the documentation that you have in your agenda, uh, you have several pieces of information there. One, first you have the memo that kind of describes what our tax rate was last year. And again, this is a yearly meeting that is required by the state of Missouri. Um, each entity is required to set their tax rate. So this is not a special meeting, but a yearly meeting that is required. Um, last year, just to, to remind everybody, our tax rate per every $100 assessed was 4.8404. And so the process is to get the uh, yearly assessed valuations for all the county. Uh, for Smithville, we are in three counties. We're in Clay County, Platte County, and just a little bit of Clinton. So uh, we get our pre-BOE numbers, and a BOE is our Board of Equalization, not Board of Education. But in county talk, it's Board of Equalization. And so they gave us those assessed valuation numbers before the Board of Equalization meets. And what that means is... Uh, Board of Station listens to appeals. If anybody wants to appeal their assessed valuation and the post's uh, BOE numbers means that's after the fact. So we have all those back from all the counties and the state auditor has a um, portal where you enter in all the information from your assessed valuation, your previous tax levies that have been assessed, and it gives you a ceiling for your uh, normal levy and your debt service. So after taking in all those numbers for our assessed valuation uh, this year, um, we have our normal operating levy 
at 2.8479, which is at the um, highest level allowed by law. Uh, we have the temporary op operating levy, which is the Eagle Heights tax levy that was passed back in 2018. The reason it's called a temp is because that does sunset after 20 years. And so uh, the um, allowed amount for that is 0.6473 for a total amount of 3.4952. And so that is the total operating levy for the calculated ceiling allowed by law uh, that we're asking to set tonight. And then we have the debt service levy that we are asking to set at 1.2552. Um, and that is a voluntary reduction of 0.1413 uh, for a total amount of uh, 4.7504. So you'll notice that that is exactly nine cents less than last year. Um, the reason that's rolled back is part of the Hancock Amendment that requires all uh, public schools and other entities, but especially public schools to roll back their tax levy when you have assessed valuation um, above 5%. So we are required by law to uh, take the lower of CPI, the actual assessed valuation that increased or 5%. Um, our assessed valuation, as you can see in the numbers, was around 17% total across the board. CPI was at 6.5%, so that 5% kicked in. So after putting in all the calculations, that is where the number uh, again hit. So again, we'd be rolling back our levy for the Hancock Amendment at nine cents at 4.7504. Um, always fun to go through these tax calculations. I know it can be um, kind of confusing at times, so I'd be happy to answer any questions on um, any of the parts to the tax levy or how we, we got the 4.7504. Questions? I know we went down nine cents since last year, have we went down any more in previous years? I mean, what did we used to have? Sure. Um, so we did say flat the year before. We, we stayed at 4.8404. We were allowed to do that because that was a non-reassessment year. So um, those assessment increases didn't hit us as much. Of course, this year was a reassessment year. So that went to put us down nine. Um, I do have some information on that. We used to be um, about five years ago, we used to be over $5. We were about $5.19. So the Hancock Amendment over the years has continued to bring down our levy. Um, and now we're at, we'd be at 4.7504. Thank you. Yeah. And to build on what Robert said, as a reference, in two that since 2018-19, our levy has rolled back 42.8, 42.86 cents. So almost 50 cents in five years. Other questions for Mr. Hedgeford? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to adopt the 2023 tax rate. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, please vote. Motion carries uh, 6 0. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda, 9.0 approval consent agenda. There are no questions on the consent agenda. I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. We have a second. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, please vote. Motion carries 6-0. Next time on the agenda, uh, communications. Uh, comments from the audience, are there any comments from the audience this evening? Next item, 10.2 uh, correspondence. Yeah, you will see a, a correspondence in there. This is from a thank you card from MSBA. I'm just thanking us for renewing the membership. Just a reminder, November 2nd through 4th, if you are ever are able to make it, our MSBA 
conference, state conference is going to be here, held right here down at Lowe's and Bartle Hall. So hopefully you will be able to make it. But uh, that was the correspondence we received from MSBA. Very good. Next time on the agenda, 10.3 superintendent update. Yeah, I um, would like to start by thanking Robert. Um, Clay County, um, we are a charter county, so we actually go a month later than what most um, districts do to adopt their tax levy. And Clay County waited till about the last very darn minute that they went through their full BOE Board of Equalization like Robert shared, and that came out last Wednesday. So in order to get all these things put in place, get approval, um, put it in the spreadsheet, it gets it down to the state, state sends it back, go back and forth and all those things. I just want to say thank you for doing that. Um, also want to um, share, it is IT Professionals Week this week. And on uh, Facebook, there was a post that we made and put out there and just said thank you. And I know this was discussed in exec, but wanted to share with the audience as well. And there was a parent that responded through a system that we have called Go Guardian, which alerts um, if certain searches are made on our machines. Um, we were alerted. Randy and his team responded to it along with Denise Harwood. I mean, contacted that parent on a Saturday afternoon. And um, that all took place in less than seven minutes. And for all of the, the people to you know, be paying attention on a Saturday, responding so quickly, making sure our kids are safe. Uh, it's truly a commitment and just want to say thank you to everyone that responded, but particularly Randy and his team for jumping on that right away. So I did want to mention that and it wasn't uh, part of what I'd put in there initially. So thank you, Randy. Uh, several different um, updates. I did include my August entry plan in there. There were a couple pieces that as we've moved back, uh, we we get to see kind of the community from the different side. You know, I was um, announced in December, we moved in August, and now that we've been here for about a month, we've been able to see the now live in the community as a family, which has been such a, a great um, experience. Our kids have made the adjustment really well. So it's just as, you know, you get to join and be part of a tremendous organization to also see the welcoming um, attitude, spirit, all the kids with my kids welcoming in has been um, fantastic and the enormous support from our community as well. Um, you know, I think Whitney has handed out 5,000 flags because I feel like they're everywhere. Um, <laughs> they're window shades, they're everything for everyone, but um, just the amazing support of the Smithville community after being gone for so long. Um, it's, it's good to see it hasn't left, even though Smithville's a little bit larger. Uh, also really noticed how well our teachers welcomed students in and our staff to welcome students in, how much they focused on relationships, getting to know their kids, all of those different pieces, those first three weeks is so important. And you heard tonight from someone whose um, student has transferred up here, how welcome she feels after five days. Just imagine our kids have now been in a month. And how they feel it is it is amazing how much our teachers and our staff and our administrators truly take care from the moment that kid for ds and the bus ride in all the way through the school day to when they either get parent pickup or um, go home on the bus. it is just tremendous and seeing how purposeful our our teachers are as well we talk about real world learning experiences we talk about relevance in our mission that is definitely something that you can see in our classrooms as well. So um, I'll continue these all the way through December um, as part of my entry plan, but it is, it's been great to be back and I've really enjoyed it. Um, I, I did wanna share a little bit, this is a, a board goal as well, but something that I know I'd spoke with you all back before the meet and confer process. And Kim and I started a conversation <laughs> along with um, NEA, as well as our, with our classified group, just about formalizing our process as we think about um, compensation, calendars, benefits, all of those different pieces and making sure that we have student voice, or sorry, not student, superintendents, advisory councils next, I apologize, <laughs> um, but making sure we have our staff voice as part of that. Um, there's, the district's had great systems before. It, it's not that, it's just uh, trying to get those more formalized so they're written down and that way we have a process I always use the example you know if a, if a bus comes and we jumped on it would that still be be going 
would that would that process still be occurring? And I don't know that it would. So trying to put a more formalized process in place that we can make sure that we look at our calendar, obviously our benefits and our compensation all as an entire package. That's been very well received on who we've gotten feedback so far. We were able to meet with um, Sean, Gina, and Martha. We were also able to meet with Gavin, who represents our classified group. Um, so that is an ongoing process, but just wanted you to know that is that is started at this point. Um, and they, the same way the students bring up things that we would that sometimes I don't ever know about, or maybe Kim does, and and I'm the only one that doesn't know. Our staff does that same thing for us, so it it's an important communication process. You guys were able to meet the superintendent's advisory council, the kiddos that were able to make it tonight. Um, they are a really good group. We started off a little shy, not going to lie, during the first 30 minutes, but after about um, 30, 45 minutes when they really got to have the chance to develop their mission, develop their norms, um, they really started, you started to see their personalities. So I, I will read their mission to you. Um, it is advocating for improvement in the education system through student participation. So I hope as a board, you guys view them not only as a way that I get feedback and communicate, but also a way if you guys have pieces that you would like to hear from them, you you heard all the things that they're involved in. It feels like they hit about the gamut of every activity in, in our school. So please let us know if, if there's anything that we can take back to them uh, or have them come to to share with the board as well. Yeah, I think that two-way communication yes. will be key. Like, if there's a situation we're aware of, yeah. let's go there. Okay, I like yeah. that. They're, fan they're a fantastic group. You just had to break down the wall. That's all. Yeah. Beat them. Yep. Oh, wait. <laughs> it's always during lunch. Like, we pick the time, right, during lawyer time and <laughs> MTSS at the middle school on lunch. So that way, because okay. that they'll show up if we know about that, right? <laughs> um, one of the other things that based on feedback from staff, um, the district had done rounding for several years, giving that opportunity for our staff to give um, feedback to cabinet members, do that process this last summer, not this last one, but two summers ago, Kim and Michelle hosted um, a representative group multiple times, I believe six times, with about 10 to 12 people at each group um, to get feedback, make sure we're getting um, staff voice and one of the suggestions that was actually made, and I'll give um, Sean and Gina who are sitting here some credit for this, is the idea of um, years before there's been times where central offices come out to a before school meeting and try to get feedback during that. The suggestion was made to do it during the school day and give staff the option to me um, to come back and give feedback. So um, we have all five of those scheduled. They're all going to occur before Thanksgiving break. Thank you to the principals for getting those scheduled so quickly. I'm actually um, heading, we're heading over to middle school next Tuesday in Eagle. Is that Thursday or Friday? Friday. We'll be at Eagle. I will be there um, during, so at the middle school during their hours off. So all staff have that opportunity, not only our teaching staff, but also our classified staff to hear the same information, provide feedback, um, give some time just for some open questions. And then at the elementary school, it's more during their grade level times off and when Encore's off as well. So dedicating those days, giving it as an option was one of the requests, and then structuring that so our staff, one, can hear some updates. If we approve board goals this evening, it would be an opportunity to give that to them. Our principals are getting some feedback before I come, so that way there's some common themes that the staff want to hear. We can talk about those right away and then just have a time for some open questions and then get some structured feedback as well. I kind of thinking that that would be about 30 or 35 minutes and then the remainder of that hour block or um, when the grade level's off, allow staff to meet one-on-one -on -one if they would like. So to do those different pieces, but um, feedback on from our staff to do that. So we have those days scheduled. After we have those, we'll relook to see if that was a good process or to look at if there's tweaks that we need to make or do it a different way and see what we do um, perhaps before Christmas or in certainly second semester. Um, but one of those pieces that is really key, um, listening to our staff and getting that feedback. I've also been able to schedule all the elementary schools to attend their PTO. I actually got to go to Eagles last week and just absolutely 
the theme that I heard as I visited schools last spring was our parents are so supportive. This is a great place to work. Anything we ask for, our parents respond to. And then to see the PTO in action, it's 100% true. Um, all of their conversation at Eagle was about how do we uh, make sure that the teacher um, workroom is stocked? How do we, you know, what are we going to do for this event? How are we going to fulfill the teacher wish list? It was all of those things. And um, what's a way we can get kids excited? I think they're they're leaning towards penny wars right now as a fundraiser. Uh, but it was just great to see um, the teachers, of course, and families so focused on our kids. Um, you hear about it, but then when you actually get to see it, it's very impressive. So those are my updates. I still need to schedule the middle school, but do have all of our elementary school schedules. Any questions for me? Very exciting, a lot of great updates. Thank you. And I I like the idea of using the student <laughs> superintendent student advisory council. I know there's a potential issue that came up this week and one of the potential solutions was maybe taking out the kids and getting their, their solutions. So I think it's, that's a great way to go. If there are no uh, additional questions or comments, we'll move on to 10.4, Assistant Superintendent for Academic Services. Thank you. I provided a memo related to our comprehensive literacy plan. Um, new state statute requires that that is actually linked in our comprehensive strategic um, improvement plan. And so I've added a an action step under the academic excellence pillar that simply states implement comprehensive literacy plan with fidelity and it is linked there. So um, we have met that requirement. Um, Carrie Chambers, who you met at the reception, um, took that opportunity to really dive in and, and learn about um, our plan and what we've had in place. We didn't make any changes other than the references to the strategic plan, but that they're updated and aligned with our new plan. Um, also in relation to our strategic plan, our buildings are getting ready to write their own. So the cycle, for those of you who are not aware, is the district updates their plan one year and then the buildings make updated plans for a, a five-year plan as well, aligned to that. Um, so we went through the process of, of what that will look like um, at our most recent admin meeting. Our principals will um, engage our staff in building those. Um, we have six pillars in the district plan. There's no expectation that our buildings will have six pillars. Um, and they may even have a pillar of their own that is unique and not um, identical to the pillars that, that we have. So they'll go through a process of identifying what makes their building unique um, and the unique needs that come with that and then prioritizing um, their plan based upon those needs. And it could look very different depending upon what building you're looking at. So it'll be interesting to see. They're due on April 3rd, so I can present them to you at the April board meeting. Um, but I know that many of them are getting started on that um, within the next month. Um, so we've basically created a common plan for every building to use with all the materials that they need. They can adapt that as they would like and bring additional things in if they would like, but at least there's a structure there for them to use templates for them to enter their um, plans into and trying to make it as, as simple of a process as, as possible. So it'll be exciting to see what, um, what theirs come up with. My next item is, is in relation to grant funds. So um, there is a, it's called gear two funds and it's, it's specific for CTE programs and expenses that families typically incur. This last year, um, rather than parents having to submit receipts and we re reimburse parents, the state changed the process so that if we paid some funds that our parents typically pay, then we could just pay that directly and be reimbursed directly from the state. And so um, we opted to pay all of the fees for our Northland Career Center students. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but um, for any of the programs, they have to buy a uniform and all of the programs require some type of specific tools um, that they use in, the, in their program. So we covered all of that. It was about $3,700 for our kiddos. Um, both those who are starting the first year and those who are returning for the second year of the program. And then if you were at the gala, you, you heard Johnny V. Brock talk about his wish of um, buying certifications for kids. Well, that's what we did with the rest of it. So um, we have purchased 80 um, vouchers for um, certifications that our students, our ag students will be able to use throughout the year. So um, that's how we use those funds. And we'll continue to look for ways to use those if those funds continue to be available to us. 
We also have some really exciting um, grants that we're exploring for our teachers. Um, I mentioned in a recent memo that um, we had about $19,000 paid out um, for extra PD over the summer. That includes our um, new teachers. Um, they are required to attend five days of training that um, they aren't paid any, they aren't paid five extra days um, for that. And so we used our teacher retention grant um, in order to pay them $100 a day for that time. And then we have quite a few teachers who did um, over and above the required floating PD requirement for the summer. So that's what those stipends were were um, dedicated to. So that's, it's very exciting to see, um, you know, be able to use the money, but also to see that, you know, people are willing to um, do some extra um, learning, professional learning over the summer. And then um, with the Career Ladder Committee, Sean Logan happens to be one of those members. We just recently approved the plans. Um, and I'm happy to report that at this point, if everyone fulfills career ladder at the stage that they've indicated they would like to, the state will be giving us $365,000 and the district will be contributing $244,000 um, to additional stipends for our teachers. So that's exciting too. Um, just a couple other things. Oh, oh, actually, I don't wanna skip this one because it's important. Susan is probably the only one who may remember this, but before COVID, we used to have an evening where we would recognize mostly community members for their um, contributions and support of the district. And so each board member would select one person that they would honor. We gussied up the cafeteria or the high school, which with the new the new part is very easy to gussy up um, and Oprah would prepare a really nice dinner and we would come together and um, recognize those individuals at a nice sit down dinner. We typically did it on the same evening that we would do the student recognition. So we begin with the community recognition um, and then we would move in um, to the pack and recognize our students. I, I have two questions. One is, would you like to reinstate that practice? And two, Right now, there are absolutely no school events on January 29th. Let me double check. It's January 29th. <laughs> January 29th. Um, so if you would like to do that, I recommend that we go ahead and set that date for both the um, recognition dinner and the student recognitions. Yes, I would. It was me. Yeah. I, I remember it, and I, I think it was great. If that were to occur, what time did that start, just for people's schedules? So we started the dinner. Um, we started the dinner about five thirty, so that we were officially wrapped up by seven, and then we could start the student recognitions. We might want to look for the. At that time, though, we did all the student recognitions at one time, and we have moved away from that practice. So let me look at what that might look like and suggest sometimes to you. But say, say 5 to 5.30 is what you're thinking. Yes. Yeah. Is there any way, just with the focus on students, that we invite, you know, because it feels like maybe that dinner is like extra special. I just want our students, like, that's why we're here. Is there, could we invite them to the dinner or? So we know numbers wise that makes it a whole production, but I'm just we typically honor four hundred okay. plus students. Is there any, I'm trying to you know what I mean? Like I just want to make sure that they're getting the recognition or both mm -hmm. the focus on having not been there. Yeah, I, I think I don't know if any of them were recorded or I know there's certainly pictures out there. I think maybe sharing kind of what it was and some background. If there was, was any a way kind of criteria around and, it too. to, uh, you know, help to honor what they all do for us honor and then go and do it for the students. We didn't do the meal, yeah. but we do the, yeah. Okay. We might be able to think of something and benefit for the students as well. Yeah. It may and not be a dinner. About that, the last one that even just some of the awards or how we're recognizing them, maybe we could chat about that and get some input mm -hmm. um, as it is board award night maybe yeah. I think there were a few things that we talked about with that so maybe we can 
just have time for one more. We were thinking about tying the awards to the portrait of a graduate. So, mm -hmm. but if you all have some specific ideas, um, you know, I typically start soliciting um, names in, if we're doing it in January, I'll send that out in November. So we have time to consider. If you have some suggestions, send them my way and then we could um, have a dialogue about that and uh, maybe at our next board meeting to get that finalized. Yeah. So, okay, very good. We'll get that going. I do have a couple of other things. Um, we do have some APR data available and we have not received a timeline yet of when we can actually release things. But what I can tell you is that so far our performance is very consistent with last year. Um, they will add this, the one score point that was not included in the last year's total was the response to the standards. I don't know if you all remember um, we had to respond to six different prompts. Um, so that will be scored this year and that will be included. And I do have an opportunity until the middle of next week to go through and make sure that um, we've given been given proper credit for our students on their ACT, their work keys, their ASVAB, ACCUPLACER. So um, I will look, because I would like us to get a few more points there if possible. So I'll be looking at that, but for the most part, in the growth part, I can't predict that um, because if you recall, they changed the way that they um, assign those points. It's not just, um, you know, if you, you get a one or a two, you could get a 1.3, you could get a 1.9. So it's that one's not easy for me to, to figure out. Um, but I will tell you that we did have growth in every one of our areas with the exception of social studies and that government exam, but the others we did. So that was good. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, I feel like we'll probably at least be the same as we were last year, and that was not a bad place to be. Mm -hmm. And lastly, we have some um, some data that I'll be sharing with you at the October meeting. Um, there are a couple of new assessments that we gave this this year. Um, you, um, the updated assessment plan had the fluency test for K through three. That is a requirement with Senate Bill six eighty one. Uh, so we've just administered that, and I'll be able to provide some data related to that to you. We also did the kindergarten observation form for the first time this year, and that was a kindergarten readiness assessment. And so I have um, data from across the district on that as well. And um, that's just a measure of a variety of, um, of skill areas and just gives us an indication of how prepared our kiddos were when they walked in the door. It has nothing to do with us, just to um, let us know where, where they were as far as their preparedness. Um, we do have some plans for that data. Uh, we will um, align it with uh, looking at our screening data that we pull in in the spring. Um, so we can look at our, you know, at our kids who have been into a preschool. Have they, did they do better than the kids who didn't? Things such as that. So we'll be able to do a little bit of comparison. And then I'll also bring um, our updated market value assets. We're preparing that for the Warrior Wire to send out to our community as well. So I'll have that for you in um, October. So unless you have any questions for me, I think that's it. Oh, you know what? I did have one more. Board candidate workshop. We were looking at November 30th. Those of you who typically attend that, would November 30th work for you? And of course, everyone's welcome to that one. Yeah. We're trying to get our, our evening obligations solidified pretty early so that we all are aware. And Sit. I believe it was an hour, mm -hmm. I, six to seven or six thirty, seven thirty. Either would work. Thank you for me. Do you have a preference, Susan? Uh, I think not you on say Thursday. Thursday. Okay. Thursday, I can do anything else. Okay. So, is six okay to pencil in for the board candidate workshop? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. <laughs> There's a lot of excitement around that one. That's good. All right, thank you so much. All right, if there are no additional questions for Dr. Catterfield, we'll move on to 10.5 Executive Director Support Services. All right, thank you. Um, in your packet, you have a construction update, and hopefully you guys like the updates that JDM gives. I have some, some nice pictures um, and kind of gives the current progress and kind of a two-week look ahead. Uh, so a lot of the projects are, are wrapping up um, and in kind of that completion stage where, you know, it's school ready, uh, but maybe they're doing some tweaking on some HVAC units or, you know, they're just now all the sidewalks were done before school started, but we're, we're finishing up the sod and hydro seating. So 
those projects are, are getting that final bow tied up and, and completed. And then look ahead, the, the focus really goes on to the transportation facility and, and doing what we need there. So last meeting, I talked a little bit about the soil surcharge and what that looks like. And so I asked him to kind of type up and, and kind of give a graph or a, a, a picture and steps of what that looks like. And so, as you can see on page two, um, they kind of give an explanation of what surcharging looks like um, and why it's important to make sure that the, the ground there at the transportation facility is settled before they build um, any footers in that area and the foundation. So um, hopefully that kind of gives a brief explanation of what's going on. So you're going to obviously see the, the dirt built up in that one spot and just sit for a while. Uh, people are going, well, what's going on? How come things aren't you know, shaking and moving there at the transportation facility? Well, that that is part of the plan. We're getting that soil to compact. Um, our engineers are coming in, measure that compaction every week. Then once they feel like it's at the levels needed, then they'll get the go ahead to take all that dirt off and then start the process of uh, getting the footers poured and getting that foundation poured. So kind of wanted to give a, a quick update and what's going on there. So we're excited to get that process started. Uh, the estimate time on that is somewhere around two to three months. Um, but because this is a prefab building that's coming on site, um, you know, once that's completed, you will see when that shell comes on site, I mean, it'll be more quickly like, wow, it's already already up in there within a day or two. And then, of course, you know, they'll be doing all the inside work during the winter and spring. So wanted to give a quick update on construction. So any questions on construction project and, and some of those items there? All right. Um, an exciting update I wanted to give is about transportation. So since 2020, um, we have had some sort of double route um, where a bus driver has to pick up a group of kids and drop them off at the school and go run to a different area and drop them off. So um, with your help in, in last year when we tweaked, you know, the contract with DS Bus and was able to do some things to promote us hiring bus drivers, um, we've been able to train enough drivers to where starting Monday, we will have no more double routes or double drop routes in our district. So wow. that is a celebration. I, I see Christy jumping down over there. Um, <laughs> if we can just get 92 construction highway done as well, <laughs> Um, we'd be in a better spot, but that part's out of our control. We'll do what we can control. So we're really excited. I, I want to, um, you know, thank those that work at DS Bus. They are a contractor. They obviously don't work for um, Smithville by definition, but they are on our team and they they have the same care for our kids just like we do. And I appreciate all the work our bus drivers are doing and everybody that works with DS Bus to try to make sure that we got to this point. So it is still a diff difficult um, environment out there for recruiting bus drivers for all schools across the nation. Um, but we're happy to be in the spot where we're at right now. So I feel I feel good about it. So yay for transportation on that part. Um, other thing I wanted to mention is a little bit of school finance. Uh, Desi released some information about the state agency target. And you're like, well, what is the state agency target? Well, that is what the funding per student is used in the foundation formula. And the foundation formula is how the state calculates what they're gonna pay um, an individual public school district for state funding. So our state funding is somewhere between, you know, 36, 38% of our total funding. Obviously local effort is our highest amount of funding and revenue that we have, but state is, is right behind it in second. And so it's exciting to hear that they're looking to raise the SAT for the first time um, since 2020. Uh, currently the SAT and for this fiscal year is 6,375. Uh, but with that, they have the pandemic provision, which means we can use um, enrollment data all the way back to 2019, 2020. Usually in their foundation formula, you can only use the current year or the previous two years. And so they've allowed that uh, provision. Well, next year, they're not going to allow that provision anymore. So a lot of schools across the state have, have reduced enrollment, different, it varies in different regions um, and different, different parts, but there is reduced enrollment. So to compensate for that, uh, they have proposed raising SAT um, for next fiscal year, FY25, to $6,760, that cost would be $125 million to the state. And then for FY26, they want to take it up to $7,145. So that is the proposal. Um, we, we hope to see that happen. And, and it's all up to the state legislature from this point. So a good indication of that happening is the governor does a state of the state address in January. And so if he includes that in his budget in January, we have a good feeling that the legislators will honor his wishes and put that in their legislation as well. Um, you know, you guys are probably familiar with getting those legislative updates during the spring. It's, it's all over the place sometimes of, of what's going on. You think something's going to pass. It doesn't. So, you know, anything could happen. But 
we feel really good about Desi's recommendation. That's the first step. And they're making that first step here. So we're excited to see that, um, you know, happen. They've also tweaked some other things in the formula. They're looking to bring their um, free and reduced lunch percentage down. So with WADA, if you're above a certain amount of special ed percentage, um, free and reduced lunch, um, English language, ELL, English language learner, they allow more money for that weighted payment. And so if you are above those thresholds, you get more. And so they've lowered that free and reduced lunch. I've heard rumors would be about 16%. That'll put us close. Um, so that's exciting news from the state to have, you know, that news come out. So we'll find more in January. I'll keep you updated, but just wanted to give you that update from, from Desi in the state. Is that about $350 for her students mm -hmm. uh, for the first year, per year, I guess, for those two years? Right around there, yes. Yep. They're calling it 400, 400 next year. Yeah, 800 total. Yep. And so, quick math, what do you think the offset is? And so the reduced Board attendance, so they're going to get rid of that pandemic provision. So we you know, have to use more current data for enrollment, then they'll pay more per student. So that's. But we're going to still end up on the plus side. Of that. For, for our enrollment, I believe we'll be on the plus side out of that. Some uh, districts that have lost 15, 20 percent of their students, they they might see um, more of a loss. And then some some districts might be a wash. But I feel our, our enrollment is held pretty steady. We have lost some. But steady, more steady than others, and so I think we will see a, a a positive out of this. And if it goes through, that would be effective for budget year one. FY twenty five, which will be next fiscal year. Next one for school year twenty four twenty five. Correct. Yep, that is correct. Okay. We would officially know basically the first week of May is when both sides get together and hash it out because they wait till the last minute. And that would be before our budget in June. Yes. Before mm -hmm. budget, yes, yeah, we would know, and we for sure, they'll approve it. What May fifteenth, May eleventh, whatever the last day of the session is. Yeah, we would know a month ahead. Yeah, that'd be critical. Yes, it will be. Yeah, absolutely. So we're excited to hear that news. Yeah, we'll be back. Yeah. Any other well, questions? Sorry, keep go ahead. I was going to add something. Any questions for Robert? Sorry, uh, plenty other questions later. <laughs> sure. so, sorry. <laughs> One of the um, things is Robert was talking about our enrollment and saying pretty fat. We have not had it. I've mentioned this before, not had a demographer report over the last seven years. Is that right, Robert? Now Preston did the last one. Yeah. Thank you. So we have drafted one. I've actually sent it out to cabinet members to look at, uh, to send out, but you may see that next month that, or not next month. We may send that out as an RFP, get some initial numbers back and then, if that is something we would like to go ahead and do with a company, you would see that next month to potentially approve. If we were to go out on a contract right now, we're just getting proposals to potentially move forward with, but um, we would fill you guys in with that. I do think it. Does everyone understand what that means? You want to describe what the demography Yeah. Is? So what it would do is give us an in-depth look on the things that I'd ask in there are basically three years to five years of trend growth of where we've been, what was as well as low, medium, and high expectations moving forward. Most demographers will tell you their reports are good for about two years. And then after that, kind of it all it all kind of flies out the window. It should tell us where um, there are permits pulled, houses being built, what timeline that would be. It should tell us potential families. It would also tell us. Um, as families are moving in, the rate of ch of child age students moving in with those families. So you may see a population growth, but it's people coming both retirees, for instance, or there's a lot of an example I always use is usually what used to occur when apartment complexes came in for every 10 apartments you counted for two students. Well, now the trend has moved pretty away from that. It's basically one to 10 now. So those different things as they work with uh, really districts is who we're looking for throughout the area to potentially come in and do that type of data with us and give us some predictive enrollment data of what we can anticipate moving forward for at least two years. Uh, Cause that's what they say. Obviously you don't have to do it every two years. That's not it, but um, it would provide a clause in there for us to potentially re up as we wanted over the next five. That answer. Yep. Okay. Any questions? All right, thank you very much. We'll move on to 
11.1 general financial review, including the FY23 preliminary ASPR. Yes, so in this agenda item, we have our typical general financial review information, but we also have information on our ASBR. And first, um, before I get started on some of the ASBR information, um, I want to thank Karen Kopp. Um, Karen spends a tremendous amount of time um, bringing data together in SUI, uh, filtering through the data, making sure that everything in there looks right, feels right, um, uploads to Desi's website, looks through different indications of things that, that maybe, um, you know, we might need to to look at, you know, make some of those modifications and make sure those are approved every year. So she spends a ton of time making sure that um, our data that we have is, is always approved from Desi and I appreciate all her hard work for that. So um, thank you so much, uh, Karen. And so in your agenda item, you have our full ASBR report, um, you know, right there on the first page, the, the first thing they always show you is our fund balances on all of our funds and shows where we're at for um, our reserve ratio. So our reserve ratio again is um, fund one and two um in, in both of those accounts and how that compares to our total expenses and so if you take that right now our fund balance is at, at 24.07 percent and so you're familiar with our board policy diaa i would bring up the document yeah. this one And so you take the uh, fund balances from one and two divided by expenses and we're, we're at 24 again. So um, DIA says um, our board policy is reserves from 21 to 26%. And so right in the middle of that is 23.5. So we are right about the middle of uh, being um, in our board policy, which is a, a great spot to do a lot of things. So I always like to use the term, um, you know, we're healthy and not wealthy. And so we are in a really good spot. Um, so if I had to give a theme to this year's ASBR, it would be strong revenues. And so there's a lot of different reasons that strong revenues came in. Um, and a lot of those reasons are people here sitting in the room, um, a lot of federal funding. Uh, we had one-time programs like ARP with, with IDA and, and making sure that no stone is unturned, you know, the programs that Andrea deals with and to make sure that all of our expenses are, are calculated and applied for. Um, a lot of different grants, grow your own grant, we have Coffin grants. And so there was a lot of those ancillary um, funding mechanisms that, that haven't been there in the past, honestly, until post COVID that we applied for um, and, and was able to get. So a lot of those come in in May and June, late in the budget cycle. And so having those come in late and really strong allowed us to push our revenues uh, really high. Um, the second part to that is our expenses. Um, our building principals have our, their budgets, they work within those budgets. And so um, if you look at our, our expense budgets, you can see that um, those came in and you know at budget, um, you know, make sure that they're fiscally responsible. So a lot of my job with this is really just to be the messenger to say, hey, here's the picture that, that it paints for us. And it's really everybody in this room um, that worked hard to make sure that, um, you know, every type of revenue that we could apply for, whether it was ECF funding with technology and E-rate um, to how those monies were being spent at the building um, came in where they asked. So um, I'm really excited about this ASBR because it puts us in a great position moving forward to look, to do a lot of different things with that flexibility um, where it puts us right in the middle of uh, policy DIAA. And so, uh, you know, this document is is a, a, a large document with ASBR. So what I did is I tried to do a quick synopsis, kind of a, a one pager that showed um, where we came in total for revenues. So budget, we were budgeted around 56.7 million in revenues. We came in at 57.8. Um, and so we were 1.82% above um, projected, which is just over a million dollars in the black. And then it shows the revenues by source, if you'd like to see how those are broken out. And then, of course, it shows all the revenues by object. And I, I did a top five above and under budget, just so you kind of see um, some, some areas in there. And I, I put quick descriptions. Some of those descriptions may make sense. They may not. So I'm happy to answer any questions on, on those. And then on the expenses side, how we came in per fund, uh, what those percentages look like, and then some areas where we were above or below and, and some of those. And so some of those areas where you see some discrepancies like, um, you know, supplies, uh, we used to take all of our E-rate funding from the federal government we get for technology and put it as a credit to our expense account. Well, our auditor said, I'd rather not see it done that way. I'd rather see it put to a revenue account and not a credit to an expense account, even though the only reason we bought some of those items was because we had that ECF E-rate funding. So um, some of those changes late in the game, um, you know, have some of those variances, but um, the total cost of the district is the same. 
just whether it was put in the expense side or the revenue side or things like that. So a um, lot of information here, I know, um, and a lot of uh, information I'm just throwing at you there real quick, but um, be happy to answer any questions um, either on the full ASBR report and what some of those things mean or um, some of the things that I put on that um, page report that kind of shows some top fives and just some some overall information. Okay, I got a question. Um, obviously, later in the agenda, we're going to have uh, uh, another item for substitute teachers um, that requires additional cost that was not a, a part of our original budget. Uh, but uh, kind of like last year, I'd like to make the same request as last year um, that uh, we do a rolling reconciliation. Remember how we did that? Let's start and start with our. Uh, um, we assumed we were going to be at a negative five hundred thousand, whatever yep. you know, deficit when we adopted the budget, and uh, at the same time we thought we were going to be around a, a projected twenty percent reserve. And now we know with the ASBR we're going to we're at twenty four percent. So can we just start with uh, sure. that? So you know, next, where, where our budget was yeah. and then the events that happened since. And I think that kind of made uh, made sense to mm -hmm. board members last year as we were making financial decisions that are, you know, out of the budget cycle. Absolutely, so, yeah. Because uh, uh, there are a lot of questions around, you know, items that are out of the budget cycle. And so um, it would paint a good picture for, I think, all the board members when they're making these decisions. Uh, I, know, I think, you know, we had... The emergency teacher hires, right? That probably were not a part of that budget, right? But uh, those events, and we made the decisions on substitutes last month. So just a rolling reconciliation. So I'd say uh, start with our budget deficit, uh, and then this this uh, uh, reconciliation you put together. Mm -hmm. Just concentrate on the you know fund ten and fund twenty. Sure. Uh, we know that we revenues are better than expected. We know that expenses were a little bit better than expected and just kind of roll it down to another balance again. Sure. Yeah, so. just a preview next month will be your second budget revision. And so that second budget revision, you know, that first one's in June when we didn't know, you know, full AV yet. We didn't know what we're going to set our tax rate at. We didn't know, you know, what teachers were, we were going to hire and what experience they had, whether they're at A1 or J25. So, um, that second budget revision will show a lot of all that dust settling, and then I'll be able to show all those decisions with a rolling um, right. reconciliation and, for you. And so to Mr. Nichols' point from last month, you know, when he asked about this teacher, we le left at this amount, and then this teacher came in at this amount, that could be a part of that. So he was wanting that question answered. That could be a part of a reconciling item on that. So we can feel comfortable. I won't feel comfortable talking about the substitutes and passing it tonight. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll feel more comfortable whenever all these numbers are kind of put together sure. and maybe we can have a more of a conversation on yeah. the substitutes. Yeah, you'll have that full um, second budget revision, uh, which will have the ASBR because the last budget revision had, you know, budgeted still. So this has the actual numbers. So all those different columns that show actual, you'll have three years of actual. Then you'll show this year budget. It'll show what our new um, budgeted number is for this year. And and just to give you a quick preview, it is it is reduced from about 500000 to about 100000 Right. So a lot of that is strong personal property and, and new construction. Um, and so with the tax rate, now that we know the tax rate is set, you know, that that really clears out where our budget is for, for going through. And just a quick math, it looks like we would be projected that our, even if we ran the $500,000 deficit, we should end up around a 22% reserve. Absolutely, still. we would still be in, in board right. policy, no doubt about it. Yeah, so we're still way above than what we were projecting back in June. So Correct. And we're still, in a pretty good position. So. Yeah. And to your point, and, and correct, Robert, are we still, as people think about numbers, round numbers and percentages, 300,000 is roughly 1%. Well, right. Correct. So right now it's 400,000 because it used because to be of our new 347 used to be our AV. Yeah. Now we're at 403. Yeah. So now you can think of 400,000 instead of 300,000. Yeah. So, so when our reserve is, for instance, just to clarify, if yes. it's from 20% to 22%, that's about $800,000 expense. And but, just to be clear, these uh, I know you uh, covered all the information and in, uh, summarized in this analysis, but this paints a pretty positive financial picture for the district. I think that's just, I know it's stating the obvious, but 
pretty good to point out. Yeah, agreed, Patrick. And, and you know, adding the 2,500 to the base last year, um, you know, it, it was aggressive at the time, but we also anticipated great numbers from the state, great numbers from AV. And so those came in. And so we're sitting in a really good spot. So absolutely. So kudos to the board for, for being aggressive in those areas. And we're, we're sitting, you know, you're right in the middle of board policy of, of your fund balances. So, um, you know, pretty much you're in a great spot to do, do things that, that you are, your goals, whatever mm -hmm. those, those are going forward. And so, so I know be aggressive. Dr. Moss has those in the agenda <laughs> yeah. later on. So Could a lot of conversations. About it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, uh, you know, just seeing that picture, you know, next month, I think I'll make everybody feel a little bit more comfortable. Sure. So, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. Cause I, you know, hearing being fiscally responsible and I understand that, but I, I guess I'm being a Debbie Downer too. Cause I'm like, man, we could have done so much more, you know, um, for, and so I think that, uh, I'm eager for the next meeting to discuss what else we can do. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You can't anticipate like they, the state did a hundred thousand uh, dollar late uh, prop C payment. Those are, those are impossible to anticipate. Um, we had, we were about $250,000 in the red for insurance going into May. And we had a fantastic May and June that, that put us right around, you know, zero. Um, I think we were about like 20,000 in the red for insurance when we thought we were going to be 250. So we thought we we're going to have to make a supplemental payment. So those things, you know, are hard to predict, you know, is someone going to have surgery? Is someone, you know, so those pieces to it make it um, difficult as you start to get towards the end of the fiscal year. Um, but they came in great and a lot of things clicked at times. Things can't click, you know, um, back in 2016, we had $500,000. We had to make a supplemental payment for an insurance and some things didn't come in and then it went the other way. So um, you try to put a paint a picture in the middle, and then sometimes it comes in great like it did. Sometimes it doesn't. But I try to put that middle of the road picture so that way, um, you know, if it does sway, it doesn't do, go too far one way or the other. But we're in a great spot. Yeah, I think it gives us a really good opportunity to be aggressive again. Um, and I will say at all of my new superintendent meetings, the number one topic was I can't believe there was a supplemental payment for Prop C. So since they talked about it so much, I realized that was not common. but it certainly helped us as we look at our, our budget moving forward, getting that hundred thousand dollar pay. And also a lot of credit, we maximized every grant, whether that was DESE or federal, including our title funding, uh, which was, which was really strong. And that again, goes to credit to the team. And again, something they continue to look at whether it's IDEA through all the federal or whether it's just our title fund. So. Yeah. Children's Been, service fund is one. Yeah. Um, children's service fund. In, one thing uh, to note as higher interest rates are not a buyer's best friend in the housing market, it made for really strong sales. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Remind so, us. Um, one of the things I did want to mention um, on the top five on revenue, so earnings from temporary deposits. And so you can see that was 90,000 above anticipated. Um, some of that was our new partnership with MoCat and be able to use some of their investment vehicles. And so, you know, having the Fed funds rate push up like it did really helped our investments. Um, and so that was another pleasant surprise that, you know, you weren't necessarily expecting to see um, from interest. In the past, you know, last year we collected um, over $700,000 in interest. Three years ago, we collected under 150000 And so, you know, those type of things have definitely changed the landscape. So we pay really close attention to um, interest rates moves and what we can do with um, our local effort money that we get in January, and then also our, our bonding uh, dollars that we just received. And so those are sitting in those investment accounts until we get those bills and pay them. So earning as much interest as they can. So um, those have been, been great assets for us. As a home buyer, it's not helping me. <laughs> <laughs> great discussion. Great summary. Thank you. Any ad additional questions on this one? All right, fantastic. We will uh, move on to 11.2 Stonebridge Lift Station MOU. Yeah, so the transportation facility, back to that. Um, so when we looked at the sewer line for um, our transportation center, uh, the only lift station available to be able to take that line to uh, was severely undersized. And um, when talking with city administration, um, they gave us a price to be able to add our facility onto that 
uh, lift station. And so, um, you know, I thank them for their work on that, but I wanted to do my due diligence to make sure there weren't other options for us. And so currently we have a lift station at Horizon um, that pumps up to the middle school and the middle school pumps up to um, Liberty Street and then takes it out that way. And so um, I had our engineers look at pricing of taking our um, sewer line of the transportation facility instead of going to Stonebridge of taking it uh, over to Horizon. And so we'd pump from, from transportation facility to Horizon to middle school uh, to Liberty Street. And so looking at the cost analysis of that and, and um, just running the lines alone was about eighty or $90,000. And so much less than doing analysis to realize, okay, are the pumps right size to add on all the load that we're going to put on at the transportation facility that's going to have a wash bay and a lot of different runoffs. So in talking with our engineers and doing analysis, um, you know, they agreed that, that, you know, working with the city to upgrade the Stonebridge lift station would be the best um, scenario for our district. Um, and so we created the MOU, which um, is an agreement of understanding with uh, the city that we would contribute 50,000 up front and then 50,000 at completion. Um, and they would let us add our transportation facility onto the line immediately, as long as we didn't use the wash bay until they got that line upgraded. And then we would add the wash bay usage on. So we just wouldn't wash buses until they got that upgraded. So um, our legal counsel is the one that created the MOU. Um, this MOU did go in front of the city aldermen um, last month and they approved it. And I'm bringing it in, in front of our board to, to ask for you to uh, approve it as well. As we put that facility in, and I know that uh, Stonebridge community has struggled with several things related to lift station down there. I think this is a great way to show being a, a good neighbor and a good partner. I agree, it helps everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really does. Are there any questions on this? If not, entertain a motion <laughs> to approve the MOU on a lift station. So moved. Second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. If there's no it's additional discussion, level. please vote. Three board meeting. And Patrick, am I correct? The total cost for that's a little over one point. This, yeah, the city's cost. Is about one point one to one point like one point one one point two million. Yeah. Our contribution is hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah. And further maintenance on it will be. Yeah. So in the MOU, you will see that that once we you know pay that upfront cost, any type of upgrades, repairs, anything is, is the city owns it, and the city would be responsible. Fantastic. Motion carries uh, six point zero. Next on the agenda, eleven point three. As uh, folks may be aware, we've been discussing substitute pay uh, for some time and uh, last uh, several months have had several discussions on this and have asked that uh, we continue to be updated on, on this on kind of where we stand and so i believe we've got an update and this is listed as info action and if uh, the info we see tonight uh, requires board action it's, it's there for us to do so if not uh, we have we have the info and uh, can decide how to proceed and it's still early it's we've had about two weeks worth of subs most of the time the first two weeks are pretty held tight for it so uh, so we just wanted to you know keep the conversation going the administration's always looking for ways how can we support our staff um, we know that one way to support all staff uh, whether it's support staff teachers or administrators is was having adequate substitutes in the building so we wanted to make sure that we're providing some information to you on a regular basis um, we've gotten a lot of really positive feedback um, from retirees on jumping our retiree substitute rate of pay up to uh, 141 per day. Um, we're pushing that message out to not only our retirees, but retirees across the metro area. Um, so we hope to be the destination for retired school districts who are wanting to substitute. Um, so that's been really positive. Actually, this week, we've had another one of our retirees who retired a few years ago sign up to be a substitute. So we know the word is getting out there and it's having a, a positive effect. Um, the other thing we want to look at and to continue to analyze is what is the impact of our current regular substitute rate of pay? We elicited some feedback from the buildings. I provided that for you there, although pay is not the only indicator for why a 
person would substitute in a particular district or area, it is um, a factor that definitely we're seeing come to the surface. Um, and then um, lastly, something to remind you of is that there's a little bit of an inverse effect. Our um, annual leave day payout for our staff is directly tied to our regular substitute rate of pay. And so when that substitute rate of pay goes up, so does the amount of payout for leave days for our staff. And so if those leave days carry more value, then the hope is that unless it is a need to be out for illness or a specific personal reason, that the staff members will hold on to those days because they know that the monetary value is higher and that will be paid out to them, um, either in selling days back to the district or um, if and when they leave the district. So just something to consider as we continue having this conversation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have around this topic. Well, I wanna share a little bit with um, you all, Kim has continued to work with her team on how to break out the data. You guys see the chart at the bottom of filled, unfilled, filled internally. We're going to, we had, she just came in and talked to me today about even breaking that out further to look at how those are being filled internally and break that data out more. So we will bring that back in October. So you guys will have a, more information and you can see just August to September how the numbers go up mainly because there's there's things that we provide our staff opportunities to do internally with professional development. There's also opportunities that they could do in the region. Um, and then there's obviously sickness and those other things that are going around. My son's at home coughing right now. So um, those different, different pieces, but do you want to, yeah, I've been good. I don't know how <laughs> I've been in school in a while. I figured I'd be the worst one. Yeah. Uh, but no, just wanted to keep that in front of you guys and, I heard you say uh, maybe after the budget is certainly reconciled and that October, as Robert would say, would have a lot more beef to it. That's certainly something we could bring back. And I and I also heard yeah. um, potentially, Patrick, if you don't mind sharing, if I share our conversation or would you want to? Yeah. No, I uh, I just want to comment. I, I know that I uh, keep bringing the subs up. Um, and I, I appreciate you guys keeping us informed because I don't I think it's important we don't lose track of it and that we uh, are observing the data that we do have um, just to make sure that we stay ahead of a potential issue. Because I think this does have a direct impact to teacher morale as well as student success. So if there's an opportunity for us to stay ahead of it, I think that the data will show that. But uh, yeah, if you want to go ahead, uh, some of the thoughts that I shared with you and ideas that I think that uh, I'd at least entertain being explored. And the, Patrick called yesterday and asked, is it legal? Yes, this is legal. There's lots of districts that what they do is they hire what's called a permanent sub. Um, sometimes those are people that simply qualify for a sub certificate, which is 60 hours of college credit or the training that the state now provides. Um, one of the ideas he had is, would we potentially identify, um, it could be at semester in this situation, teachers coming out, graduating at semester, but don't have a job yet, hiring them as a permanent sub, um, putting them, paying them as a teacher, having them go to our buildings on a daily basis. And then the way I described it in my conversation with Patrick is that basically becomes a five month job interview where when that when we do have jobs open and not everything may fit what their skill set is they they could have that opportunity to go interview with our principals and and be in that but it would be you know someone who's fully certified someone we would want to potentially look at in the spring um, and that's something we would bring back to you in October as well do we have permanent subs right now well our or, definition is a little bit different I, I guess is it a full-time sub or is it a permanent sub <laughs> So we've got several Lots categories. Go ahead and we have, right, we have several categories. I mean, so a regular substitute at Smithville is someone that will pick up jobs based on, you know, if they want to sub that day or not. So they meet all the credentials of a substitute for Desi. They come in and they sub when they want to. 
we um, have what we call here in the district permanent subs. They're regular substitutes, but they report to a specific building um, two or three days per week is typically um, the way that works. So they get to pick the building, they get to um, pick the days. And so we call them permanent because they show up on a regular basis, but they're not paid in the way that Dr. Moss is describing um, that some districts are hiring full-time provisionally or certified teachers to serve as substitutes until a role opens up for them. Um, it's easier to do in a large district um, because you know you're going to have more vacancies at the end of the school year, um, but it's definitely something that we can explore because we do have vacancies each year. So that's a new concept to our school district. Would. And, that would be new for us. Um, would uh, we can the, the go ahead, Scott. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Big qualified do candidates. Yeah. What we call permanent subs today who come into a specific building, can they, can those individuals, they're not exclusive to our district or are they, can they pick up shifts at other school districts at will as they so please? They can, they can okay. pick up um, jobs at other districts, but typically mm -hmm. our permanent subs do not because yeah. They've kind of hit that sweet spot. They want to work part time. They want to work a couple of days or three days a week, and they really enjoy the school building that they've chosen. Patrick, are you done with your questions? Yeah, you can go ahead. I'll mute. <laughs> um, yeah, on this issue, I'd like that we just hold until next month until we get all the. Uh, financial information because I know that we've had board members including myself that are concerned about finances when we're doing off budget items um, and can we bring it back as the entire smorgasbord of options again the buffet of options sure instead of just the one um, because I figure out the name for it is a buffet yeah, or a smorgasbord yeah I can't uh, yeah we need to determine that first because I think we need to revisit the internal fill rate uh, uh, dollar figure again um, because we know that subs are an issue for every school district. Um, even if we raised uh, to the $20, we know that that's not a silver bullet solution. Uh, and teachers are going to have to cover still. Uh, I'd like to have that. So I just bring back all the uh, solutions again. And um, so we can have a conversation and Robert can be ready to answer if we want to adjust any uh, uh, dollars here or there. Um, also, can you add the solution of uh, the $50 substitute bonus uh, after five days of two weeks? Uh, you had a write-up in it in the October 2020 and November 2021. Uh, it looks like, I, I don't know if that's going to be something we can look at it changing to, but you had a nice little write-up on that in those uh substitute uh, memos back then. Mm -hmm. Also, um, could you include, uh, I don't know if we have this updated or not, uh, the attendance and retention program. Uh, we had one for 2022. Mm -hmm. I thought that had a lot of good information. Um, uh, staff attendance yeah. and reasons for leaving. Yes. We actually have been working on that report. Mm -hmm. We are basically finished with it. We just need to tie a bow on it for you so we can bring that to you in October. Okay, great. That would be perfect. I think that would be good to have all this information in front of us to make good decisions. So. Kim also share, has been sharing an HR report, which I believe has been very well received towards the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Would you want her to go ahead and put that in at the end of September? as well and bring it to October if it's ready. Yeah, if it's ready. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it's there's, ready. It doesn't so say she's going to yeah, have it. Yeah, have that it's good to read. Yeah, yeah, I just. It's a know. big report. Yeah. Uh, and then if we're able to have uh, um, substitutes um, by building, um, I know that we do it by month. Um, and I don't I know if we that have that. Also, um, and I failed to share that with you. So I can put that in a Friday update as well as Bring okay. it back in October Great. as well. And um, I don't know if we have this or not. I don't know if we have this defined or not. Um, what is our 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 percentage goal for fill rate? 
I don't know if, what are we declaring as a success? I know 100% is a success, but we've never, nobody has 100%. So we used to teeter uh, around 96%. Yeah, I saw back to 2018 uh, and we were in the 90s, low 90s. Uh, but I didn't know what uh, we considered a success if it's we 95 or 93. Principles. That should be, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But is it? Is it fair to say if you averaged over 95 or even the hot, like 92 to 95, you consider that a pretty good year, especially post-COVID? Right. Yeah. Okay. If we get back in the 90s, I would even say would be a success in what they're covering. Fair to say or not? Okay. Good to know. Yeah. 90% yeah. with external substitutes. Without internal. Yes. Absolutely. Thanks for clarifying. What what would be yeah. an example of the fill not needed? Is that like could be like a reading intervention that that doesn't have a classroom? Okay. Um, could you make it okay, I put in it shows up said not needed. What do you think? not designed to specifically for students on our day? So our step or the our support and for that testimony will step in still high value yeah. because it's required. So Okay. So it doesn't for me not it doesn't Okay. Okay. Do we need to make a motion on this or? No. No, we take full action. So um, it, I think it sounds like the will of the board is we'll, we'll uh, bring uh, additional information in, in October and uh, continue to monitor. Thank you very much. Appreciate the updates. Yep. Next item on the agenda, 11.4 board slash superintendent goals. All right. If you would thank you, Randy, for bringing up the, the PDF. So within there, there's two different documents in under this agenda item. One is a more comprehensive document that has all of our pieces, the things that we talked about, including um, if you remember, our last retreat last month was really about the rally cry. We put a what would be a 90 day outcome and declared that. And then the responsibility and job of the administrative team was to go back, figure out that 30, 60, 90 day look, as well as put together a potential year long goal. I mean, while you guys see those year long dates within there. Please know that's not the date that's planned to be delivered. That's a holding spot to say that would be the latest time that it would be delivered and certainly could be accelerated. Within the PowerPoint, I put together just a look back on the journey. So just wanted to start with looking back at our, if you'll go up to the slide above that, Randy is our, is the, through the strategic plan, uh, the mission statement was looked at again. Uh, the decision was to keep it. And I don't think, and Dr. Credifel, correct me, no re no revisions were made at this time. But just a reminder of, and those words that are, that are highlighted are important because I think it's important that as we think about our mission, and then Randy, we go to the next slide, our values, that we see those reflected in our goals as well, um, as well as in our portrait of a graduate. So the values were um, changed pretty significantly. I, I think the number may have been up to 20 different values. It was uh, lowered to be more readable, uh, be more rememberable. But again, those different pieces that we need to make sure are part of our goals moving forward, especially with the adoption of our strategic plan. Uh, the next slide, just back through the process in April. If you remember, I asked each of you for about 30 minutes of time, just jump on a phone call with you, be able to connect, talk about what's emerging for you all for priorities. That fed into our June full day retreat where we took most of that afternoon and just did some additional brainstorm, some other pieces as well um, bubbled up. And then we had that huge time really focused on finance that morning. Then in August, we had Dr. White here, uh, which I thought was very entertaining to watch him facilitate what he used to do, what he used to have facilitated with the North Kansas City Board by someone outside um, where we really developing within those buckets, our rally cry, uh, that 90 day outcome, and then our work with those embedded details. The one thing that was a repeated piece were these priorities that are on the next slide. And it had just 
it comes out not only in talking with the board members, not only comes out in talking with the administration, it really comes out with the community. Um, when I, you know, gave the reflection on my entry plan, you heard so much about the the pride and commitment of the community thinking about our students, thinking about um, Smithville. You think hear about the commitment to the staff and think about compensation and being aggressive, already thinking through what that next year could look like, and then that continuous process of building trust and transparency in the actions that we're doing each day. That was a a piece I heard throughout my pre-entry plan in that transition last year from January to May and including now. As we look at the goals, please know that they are now aligned to our pillars within the strategic plan as well. The objectives are in the other document, but up here just includes the pillars. That first dot, which is really hard to read up there, I apologize, is our rally cry. And then that dot below it is not all the goals below that, but what highlighted within here are things that we're not currently doing that we would be doing. So for example, in academic excellence, the conversation that was had in August was really talking about building trust with our staff and think through how would we measure that. So last year through, is I believe was the first year with EAB, with the staff morale survey and there are questions specific to trust and relationships that's given twice a year. Well, what we would be doing this year is looking to measure how that increases each time of building that um, with the tractor train and grow staff uh, thinking about, and if you heard our new teachers share most of the time as a district, we've compared ourselves to the 25 Metro school districts in the Kansas city region. I would like us to think through what those groups we really want to look at are because how many people did we have new to our staff that are not necessarily from those 25, but are from a St. Joe are from North of here. Yeah. Gallatin, right? Different areas where we may want to relook at what that right group is to compare ourselves to. Cause I think part of that 25, there are districts that we really just don't move staff to either within there. You know, we can certainly, lock in the Northland six. And if you include Excel, sure the Northland seven, certainly that would be part of that, but doing that, but continuing that goal. And if it's not the top eight of the 25, then let's define a new goal, whatever that, that looks on um, safety and security. While it isn't directly called out in our strategic plan has been a common theme for us for years, right. And continuing to look at how we increase. That was a big part of our executive session. Um, I, put in not this document, but the other one about bringing the proposals of SPOs, that plan would um, come to you. I think right now the plan is November. So that way it's well before the budget cycle, well before we would do that as well as after Robert would have a chance to provide that updated October. And then you'll see down below, I, I won't go through all of them. I know finances, we took that time during the retreat. It was a big conversation. Um, Robert just shared so much about the dashboard that he has um, worked with in another district uh, that really helped inform in thinking through how we compare ourselves to those other districts as well. But finding districts that are similar to us, certainly in the 92 corridor, but have similar AB per pupil, um, and they may not be necessarily in our region, right? We may be looking at some St. Louis school districts that are very similar to us or school districts outside of um, Springfield even. So that is what is highlighted here. The last slide um, is just continuing themes that we heard throughout, making sure our, our budget is directly related to our goals. We can see that if someone were to look at our budget, they would know what our goals were. Um, continuing to monitor class size, teacher compensation, um, and then monitor budget throughout this year, which um, was a conversation earlier today. So um, I share this with you to make sure that we brought back our part. Um, from the August meeting, please know, I've talked with Dr. White as well with this. He is sorry he couldn't make it. He had a big freshman football game to go watch as a grandpa. Um, so that was more important. I told him to come to this. Uh, but he, he said, the, he goes, you guys are really in the messy part. You're in the part of getting a new process going, redefining it. And two years from now, you're going to look back and go, boy, that was kind of silly then. It, it took us this way to get going, but, or it took us this long to get going, or wow, that, think about where we came from in those two years. So I share that with you. Would, would love to answer any questions or certainly other cabinet members can and anything that we could do to clarify.
we'd be happy to. And please know these goals, while drafted or not necessarily finalized, I think there would be certainly goals built on from the finance committee. Um, if, as if we get a meet and confer process going, there would be pieces built in there specific to, to um, working and talking with our classified and certified staff. Yeah, I think uh, I appreciate the focus on um, compensation. I think we've made that pretty clear. Mm -hmm. And um, I had on here class sizes, so I was glad mm -hmm. that last um, mm -hmm. slide had that. And then um, I'm glad to see the FPO priority yep. talked about in November versus March. March felt like a long time. Just a placeholder, right? honestly. And there would be other pieces within there. I know um, Michelle and I talked just today about the quarterly updates and getting the dashboard going from the CSAP or from our MSAP work. So there would be pieces done beforehand. I just think it would just be an ongoing process. But the SPO we were talking about in my conversation with Denise today, she thought she could she would bring it to you guys in November. Specific to that one. And my thoughts on the finances, although it says um, finance dashboard by yeah. June 30th, 2024, actually the key metrics and stuff we need to work out in the next couple months. Um, so we have a good idea where we're going to go with the budget by January or so. So, but the entire dashboard itself can come together a couple months after that, but we probably have the key metrics and everything else down well ahead of time. So. So obviously this document is what drives the bulk of our work then for the, the remainder of the school year, how we set up measurement, how, mm -hmm. we, how we set up your performance review. And so, you know, with that, you know, are these the goals we want to adopt this evening to drive our work moving forward? Are we? This is a, this is an action item to adopt these goals if we so choose. And are they set by no. adopting? They're not necessarily set in stone. There, this this is the direction. correct. It's it's the broad yeah. goals, right? It's the, it's the broad, right? It's the That's broad the goals. Thought, not saying. we okay. still have the okay. work yeah. to do to to line out the measurements underneath. But these are the things that we want to focus on. Then let's, okay. The yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Um, just those broad goals. Yeah, I think we. Uh, but you know, we're in September, so we need to probably start working on the finance subcommittee here pretty quick so how about the next item on the agenda yeah. additional questions on this one if not i'd entertain a motion to adopt uh, academic excellence through uh, staff retain attract and grow staff uh, safety and security public and community relations and finances are uh, board goals for this year. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, please vote. Fantastic motion carries uh, six zero. Now let's get the work on that. So next item on the agenda, uh, board subcommittees, 11.5. So we discussed uh, this and wanted to make sure it aligned with our goals. So now that we've got our goals adopted, how do we choose to proceed to make sure we get some of the stuff lined out? I'll open it up for folks' thoughts. I think there's more work to be done on uh, some of the subcommittees before they're established. I mean, I think obviously finance is probably something that we could probably move forward with. That's just a no brainer at this point. Um, that's just my opinion. Mark, um, you had said, oh, sorry, Scott. Go ahead. You had said that you had worked other places and finance was one subcommittee yes. that you have seen be beneficial and work. So I would agree with you, Scott. Yeah, I, and, start. and I've seen other places where subcommittees were, for lack of a better term, a large waste of time. Um, so as as far as an anchor, I I would agree, and maybe it is getting this started and building through. I think there is is value in, especially as we look at the first of three readings board policy. There's governance chunks within there, 
Um, that I don't see. And I think we also have to think through committees as potentially two different ways to think about it as finance is a standing committee in, in a lot of districts, not all, but it lasts forever. There are also committees that are either ad hoc as needed um, or even, hey, we need this one just to come together for maybe it's four to eight months, right? Knock some things out, put them, some things together and put it to bed. So um, th those are other pieces. I also think finance gives us an opportunity to build a baseline okay? because um, there's a lot of layers as far as like when you bring other, when you bring community members on, how do you get them involved? We need to make sure we have a process to post um, and because I would like to keep all of these meetings as open, open meetings for people to attend as well. And I will throw out the, I, I agree, finance is the, probably the one place to start and get going. I know we've got mm -hmm. someone to kind of help us get that going. The other one I think is kind of important is the community outreach piece, um, you know, as part of one of the policies we adopted earlier. Um, partly due to state requirements, we talked about the need to have a community engagement policy. And so I think that's one that I would like to see us also potentially get stood up and get working on. We talked about some potential ideas of, you know, uh, coffee with the community type of things that could kind of get going as we build that out. So I'd like to throw that out as one I think mm -hmm. we, we should potentially get stood up and get going on as well. And then our goals here, we mentioned coffee. Yeah, coffee with the yeah. community. It's part of our policy is why I put it in our goals, by the way. Yeah. It seems to me like the coffee with community, though, would come first. And then you kind of find from there if you're needing to hold additional meetings, because that's the whole point of the coffee with community, um, is to open up and let people come in. And I think that you learn from that if something is needed for a, group, a, a small group to come together and address outside of those. So maybe I think what you're trying to say is have those and then maybe a small ad hoc community come and look at those results and, and right. okay, that would feedback. be good. I like that, yeah. Or yeah, get, take the feedback from that yeah. experience and see if yeah. we need the subcommittee to be standing. I like that. Yeah, and I, we're, we're just, you know, we're looking for ways to engage the community. Yeah, I, I don't think it needs to be a standing community that, committee that gets going, but one that, you know, we get going on that process, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's just verbiage on how we get it ready. And I think it would be good to bring that feedback in as we engage the community and identify things, see if there's different pieces, if especially with the goal of um, the just that conversation around trust and transparency that's been consistent. But uh, Robert, how much uh, do we have in bond savings from our bond projects? As far as construction costs or uh, what we sold at a surplus plus interest? Well, just overall, if we, you know, we thought we were going to be at seventeen million, and then right. we came out at certain savings. Did yeah, we so have five hundred thousand million or something? So we had we sold the bond was seventeen point five million. It sold at a surplus, just over eight eighteen million. So there was five hundred thousand there. We anticipate about four hundred thousand dollars in interest. Um, our construction costs right now are pretty much right at target as far as construction savings. So we don't have a lot there, um, but we did sell at a surplus of five hundred thousand and then another four hundred thousand dollars in interest. So we just have about a million. So, so yeah, round number million. Uh, uh, the reason I ask and not to get off subject is to stay on subject is that uh, we're looking for ways to engage our community, and our community was nice enough uh, to approve these bonds for us to spend and maybe that's an opportunity to go back and re-engage our community on how we spend that uh, bond savings um, and a, a possibility for the student advisory group mm -hmm. and community members to come back together and we can lay out certain items and stuff like that now obviously they're not going to be big capital spends but maybe we can get an inventory of smaller spends from school building to school building and have the community work with administration and then, you know, kind of line out items on how we can spend that bonds. I do want to um, clarify, though, we did anticipate that surplus. So the cost of just the geo projects that we had do go up to about $18.1 million, just so you know. Now, we will have some of that interest that we'll have available, and we may have savings through construction. Uh, we also have, you know, um, reserves in our capital projects funds. So there's there's availability there, but I did want to make sure you know that we did not plan on 17.5. It was sold at a surplus purposely to to.
fund what we need. Yeah, I'm just so, saying. But yeah. it's just an opportunity. Yeah, sure. it's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We have the savings. And we still have all the data that we had from last year when we brought our community together. That was kind of that ad hoc meeting that uh, we did before we ran the bond. And so we still have some of that data for maybe projects that got left off or maybe it's a starting point to continue. Yeah. Um, but I remember those items being like more high dollar. And I figure we don't have that much money, but it's right. I figure it's an opportunity probably to walk through the high school or middle school and see if there's other smaller projects that can be done. Uh, an opportunity for administration to work with building leaders and stuff and then, you know, engage the community and see see how they want to. And maybe it's items that we haven't discussed before. Mm -hmm. so. Quick question, Robert, just on knowing that there was a lot of rock underneath the transmission pad and now we have sure put a bunch of dirt and landed on top of yeah. it and i know we're in the still the sweet spot when do you think we'll know sure. by the spring would we feel pretty confident that of what the total cost will come for that or is there a way to predict that right now i mean we're we spent probably about 90 percent of our allowances on transportation uh, the other areas we have not we've pretty much yeah. been good now that doesn't mean we're over our allowances yet but we did hit a ton of rock and when you're doing excavation that's when you're going to have the the biggest um you know possible surprise right once that's taken care of they usually there aren't a ton of surprises going forward um i would say spring would be a good time where we okay. have good anticipation on that we could build into that okay. then and we'll make sure and put that with superintendent's advisory council maybe not next month but november december building into that I figured it'd be, yeah. it'd be a lengthy process, but it's just an opportunity for us. You know, I mean, our community does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're right. Because last time we sort of made that decision, it would be nice to get their input on what. Yeah, but, I like that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, just a thought. So, oh, absolutely. Anyway, back to subcommittees. <laughs> so, finance subcommittee, I'm interested in being on three board members, I think. Mr. Nichols is interested in being on that. Yeah, so I would be interested as well. I think I had initially said that when you first asked. Yeah, that was one of the ones we listed. The three of us can be fine with me. Get with administration and start working on something. And then we, we notice those up anyway. And so with that notice up, anyone can attend that one. Okay. So Great. that's one of the keys is just making sure we, as official subcommittees, we notice up and get posted out. I'd love to see it, you know, including the Zoom link and and other things to make sure that folks can participate from wherever they're going to jump on. Mm -hmm. So we yeah, agree we, on that one. What do we want to do from a community engagement perspective? Uh, I think we need to work through that. I and mean, we definitely want our meetings to be open uh, for the finance subcommittee. Um, and how do we engage the community on that? Because I, I, that's something that's a great question because when we had that conversation and Dr. White sprung that on us in that last couple minutes of the conversation, I would like to pick his brain a little bit more on how he has seen that done because he, he had some examples. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you, go ahead. Are you thinking with the committee or with copy with the community? Uh, I want to make sure I'm not the subcommittee. Committee. Okay. He, he had a schools an example that he said involved the community mm -hmm. on subcommittees at Blue, yeah, as Blue Valley. Yeah. Blue Valley. Was one of the two he was the uh, But I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more from him how we would go about that. And I, I, before, I, before I answer that question, I guess. I would I, agree because we've had some other districts around us that have had some issues with committees and, um, so, and having public on them and, and, mm -hmm. and having issues with that and eventually uh, canceling all the committees. So I think we need to look at how to, the right way to do it. And, yeah. So with that then, would the board be comfortable if I kind of proposed a, a coffee with community kind of schedule of breaking kind of two board members up and we kind of get that piece started as we, as we seek feedback from Dr. White and others on how to maybe do a. Let's say coffee with the community can start whenever. I think it was in the next day. Would be October fourteenth. Yeah. So if, you if we did it, if we did it monthly, October fourteenth yeah. would be the next one. And we just sign up that each of us get two. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, it, that's just what it was named in the in the board policy. So 
who that is not my skill set. So if anyone has a skill set of renaming things, anyone know anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Get people oh, there, no, get them engaged. That, maybe you and I take that maybe October. Why don't you and I take that maybe October one and we go from there? Yeah. Okay. I would sounds good. I would also like us to think through and like now that goals are adopted, those big themes, how do we make sure that we're getting those out as well? Is our is our community so aware of our portrait graduate? Those like if we have a captive audience, do we do we take an opportunity to share three to five minutes of our own stuff as well before we go through a structured conversation because it's a great way to brag. It's a great way to share the great things that are going. It's a great way to, I think, to create trust when you think of our goals mm -hmm. and those things. Do we, do we need official action on that? I don't think so. Unless it's... Okay. And Karen knows the rule. All right. Uh, very good. Thank you all for a great discussion. Uh, next item on the agenda 12.1 approval of MSBA 2023 C board policy revisions for the first of three readings. So I know there are several in here and uh, would entertain questions or concerns or comments from the board. coming up two more months so here if you haven't had a chance to read them i know that some of these are ones that we've been previously discussed that you know federal language requirements to actually receive federal dollars so I want to acknowledge that it is the first of three readings so if there are no questions, I would entertain a motion to approve. Can I just say one Absolutely, thing. yeah. The only thing I was just going to say is I, I was reading through the board member qualification things and um, the, the board member ethics and nothing that I agree with everything on it, just good reminders. And just so everybody knows that um, there was legislation that to be a board member, you have to have lived in the state of Missouri and the, the district where you are going to be applying for a board member for a year prior so that that was a change that was made so um i just thought those those were good things just to read over yeah other questions comments if not i'd entertain a motion to approve uh msba 2023 uh c board policy revisions for the first reading so moved Second. We have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, please vote. Motion carries uh, six zero. Uh, next time the agenda supplemental pay. Yeah, do you mind if I share a little before the, we vote on these? Sure. Um, so I feel like we've gotten a lot of varying advice on how to vote or not to vote. There was a local school board member that just resigned for voting on a family member. So that is why you see these polled and in talking with Karen and Jeff, I think we will be very particular because it was done completely accidentally and it was done because they didn't think it was improper. And now that board member had to resign. So just that's why these were polled the way they were versus um recently what is what we i i would say even what we were told just a couple months ago yeah. we're going to err on the side of pulling things with family members in it versus not it's not a way we want to create a break no. on the board right so um with that the this first one actually is not an issue this evening because mr saxon yeah. is not present but uh, uh mrs saxon is on this list so with that 12.2 supplemental pay for september 2023 entertain a motion to approve so second there's a motion and a second if there's no further discussion please vote <laughs> motion carries uh six zero with uh mr saxton abstin uh next item on the agenda 12.3 supplemental pay for september uh 2023 uh, uh, sub C 
Uh, Mrs. Carlisle, uh, based on uh, what we discussed, will be abstaining on this vote. I appreciate you. <laughs> That's you got a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> with that, I entertain a motion to approve uh, twelve point three. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, please vote. Motion carries 5 0 with uh, Mrs. Carl abstaining and Mr. Saxon absent. Uh, next item on the agenda a new item uh, uh, being uh, that it's not a 12 point uh, whatever um, miscellaneous. It is a uh, motion to adjourn. And with that, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Like new item. <laughs> you pick whoever. Like that. No, 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 no further discussion.